Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship today at Christ the Lone Lutheran Church. Welcome to those of you who are joining us online, whether you are staying home for virus-related reasons or maybe you're taking a little bit of rest time this holiday weekend. We're glad that you're able to still tune in as we celebrate in peace and, and safety the wonderful things that our God has done for us. And, uh, and most importantly, freeing us from bondage to the devil. Uh, today we're going to be continuing our worship series that we've been going through through the book of Nehemiah. This is the fourth week we've talked about uh, the things that happened when God allowed his people to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild it, its walls. And so far in this series we've talked about what happens when God uh, lays something on your heart. You see a need in, in, uh, in your neighborhood, or you see a problem in the world, and you see opportunities to help, and that God has put you in a position to actually do something about it. Uh, we talked about what happens uh, when that first is laid on your heart, uh, when there's some planning and preparation that goes into a project like that. Uh, but then also, today we're going to talk about what happens when you have opposition to the, the good things that you're trying to do in the world. Uh, we'll look at Nehemiah chapter 4 for that. That will be the big idea for our sermon today. Our service is uh, printed for you in the worship folder, and a lot of the responses are going to appear on the, the screen if you're watching from home. Uh, so with that, let's begin to the call to worship. If you would please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and also with you. I rejoice with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I am forgiven. Let us pray. O Lord, our God, govern the nations on earth and direct the affairs of this world so that your church may worship you in peace and joy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Now, there are two lessons that I'd like to share with you in addition to the sermon text today. The first comes from Romans chapter 5. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? This is the word of God. With respect and reverence for the words and works of Jesus, please stand for the reading of the gospel. This is the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 10, verses 24 through 33. The student is not above the teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Baal Zebul, how much more the members of his household? 
So do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered, so do not be afraid. You are worth far more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated as we uh, listen to the melody and focus on the words of hymn 405, O for a faith that will not shrink. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The portion of God's word that we wish to reflect upon for a little while this morning is taken from Nehemiah chapter 4. The whole chapter is printed there on your insert and you can follow along there. Verses 1 through 23. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews. And in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What they are building, even a fox climbing up on it, would break down the wall of stones. Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, The strength of our laborers is giving out, and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also our enemies said, Before they know it or see us, they will be right here among them, and they will kill them and put an end to their work. And then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, Wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great 
and awesome. And fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives, your homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to our own work. And from that day on, half my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore his sword on his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, The work is extensive and spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. So we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. At that time, I also said to the people, Have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so that they can serve us as guards by night and workers by day. Neither I nor my brothers nor my men nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon even when he went for water. So far the word of God. Dear friends, they say that any time that you want to do something good to make a change in the world or to uh, affect something positive in the world around you, you're going to encounter some opposition. It doesn't matter what it is you do, if it is worthwhile, you will have some pushback and some conflict. It's amazing how that can happen with just about anything you do and, and even for probably the most noble thing that you can do, the the work that God calls us to do together as a church. Teaching the gospel, sharing the love of Jesus, helping prodigal sons get back home, leading people to realize the purpose for which they were made and to live the lives that they were made to live. What could be a, a higher calling than that? I mean, there are other good causes and there are other noble things to get involved in, Uh, feeding the hungry, speaking up for the oppressed, uh, saving the the polar bears. These are all good things to get involved in. But what we're talking about here is feeding hungry souls with the bread of life. Speaking the word of God into the heart of someone who is oppressed by a guilty conscience. We're talking about saving souls. Surely no one would have a problem with that, right? Surely the the church doing its most noble work would never encounter any kind of opposition. Well, actually, we do. We encounter conflict and pushback at every turn. And there's a reason for that. It's because the devil hates it when God's kingdom is being advanced. Ultimately, it's the devil who pushes back against us. Ultimately, it's the devil who opposes the work of the church, even though at times he will use humans to do that in the form of corrupt governments or false teachers, false religions, atheist groups, or even just individuals who are dead set against the gospel. Whether they realize it or not, they are the devil's defense against the kingdom of God. Because when he feels threatened, he snarls and he sneers through the mouths of people who oppose the church. And so some will say that we are too exclusive as we claim Christ to be the only way to heaven. And some will say we're too restrictive as we base our morals in the Ten Commandments. Some will oppose us because of the the view of the natural world that we base upon the creation account in Genesis Some will oppose us just because they don't want to deal with those heavy questions about morality or or about being accountable to a, a creator God. And that shouldn't surprise us because even in the race for our own hearts, Jesus does not run unopposed. So why should we not expect opposition when we try to win hearts for the name of Jesus? 
additionally, you think about the life of Jesus and everything that he encountered. He was here to affect the greatest change in the history of the world for the good of all people, and yet he still encountered probably more opposition than anyone else in the history of the world has. You think about the power-hungry rulers and the judgmental uh, religious leaders. You think about all the demon possessions that he encountered throughout his isn't that interesting? You read through the Gospels and you wonder why were there so many people who were demon-possessed uh, in Jesus' time? It's because the devil felt more threatened than he ever had before. And for good reason. The Son of God came into the world to destroy the kingdom of the devil and to build up the kingdom of God. So it should be no surprise to us then uh, when we encounter opposition because no one who has ever done anything to build up the kingdom of God has done so unopposed. I mean, you had well, Moses, he had Pharaoh, um, David, he had Goliath. The apostles, they all had the Roman emperor. Um, Nehemiah? Nehemiah had Sanballat and Tobiah. We read that in our lesson just now from chapter 4. Uh, Sanballat, he was the he was the governor of Samaria, and Tobiah seemed to be some kind of ruler in Ammon. So these are two regions that are near Judah, and they did not want to see the Jews succeed. They did not want to see Jerusalem be rebuilt. And so when they, they saw that, they felt threatened, and in, their threat, they, in, their, uh, in that threatened state, they insulted, they heaped insults upon the Jews. And, well, as Nehemiah tells it, here's what happened. It says, when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What they are building, even a fox climbing up on it, would break down their wall of stones. They were insulting the work. Look at that wreckage and rubble. These cities' walls were supposed to withstand a, a battering from heavy siege machinery. And yet, <laughs> Tobiah says, Look at that puny little wall that would crumble beneath the weight of a fuzzy little fox. What they fa failed to realize, though, was that God often works through meager means to bring about major changes. God often works through meager means to bring about major changes, and nobody knows that better than you and I. A small, local congregation, we don't have a lot of money, we don't have a lot of people, we don't have a lot of power and influence in the city, and yet there are people who are going to heaven because of the work that you and I are doing together. Think about that. I mean, wouldn't it be worth it if all of our time and, and all of our effort and all of our offerings resulted in just one eternity being changed from hell-bound to heaven-bound? And yet, by God's grace, he has provided much more than just one. God works through meager means to bring about major changes. And the outside world isn't going to see that. They're going to see this little church here and wondering, what are you doing? What do you think you're going to accomplish? And they scoff at the meager way in which the gospel works. And the word of God works alongside simple water or alongside bread and wine to save souls. And the gospel continues its quiet march and the kingdom of God continues to be built up. Yet does the opposition stop there? Of course not. So then how do we handle the haters? How do we deal with opposition? Nehemiah is going to model that out for us, and he begins it with prayer. He, he interjects 
a prayer in this narrative that he's writing. In verse 4, he says, Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in the land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. That's his prayer. And on the one hand, uh, that probably isn't the direction that I would take that prayer. Uh, he is asking God to not forgive their sins. Don't blot out their guilt it's a far cry from the prayer that Christ prayed on the cross, right? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Yet at the same time, it's not an unbiblical prayer. Many of the Psalms are written this way as prayers for deliverance. And uh, Martin Luther explains when he is explaining the Lord's Prayer, and he says, actually, every time that we pray, deliver us from evil, we're at the same time praying that the devil's plans be frustrated and that God curse the evil doer. Additionally, the people, there are people in heaven, there are souls in heaven that pray a similar prayer, right? In Revelation, we read about these martyrs, the people who were killed because of their faith and their prayer goes up to the Lord, how long, O God, until our blood is avenged? How long until you pour out your judgment on the inhabitants of the earth? So it's not an unbiblical prayer that Nehemiah is praying here, but either way, we're not, the point isn't to debate the content of the prayer. The point is that in the face of opposition, the first thing that Nehemiah does is takes it to the Lord in prayer. Gives it to God. And he teaches the Israelites to do the same. When you're insulted, don't internalize those insults instead Bring those burdens to the Lord in prayer. And when the Israelites did that, they felt like that, that freed them up to, to do the work that they were called to do. We're told that they continued building the wall in verse 6 till, the, 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 till all of it reached half its height. For the people worked with all their heart. You've probably heard the expression, work hard, play hard. Well, here Nehemiah is leading the Israelites to take on a work hard, pray hard approach. Prayer is good. Take it to the Lord when you're feeling opposition and you're feeling uh, that conflict and that pushback. Take it to the Lord, but then also keep on working. Keep putting one foot in front of another, one stone on top of another. I think there's a healthy balance to be made here between prayer and action. Sometimes I think we might be tempted to lean too far one way or the other. Uh, maybe there might be times where we over-spiritualize things, where we see a problem in the world and we pray that God would, would fix that problem, but we're not going to roll up our sleeves and get our hands dirty. We pray that the Lord will, will help those in need but at the same time, we also just assume that someone else will do that. Then on the other hand, sometimes we can be overly practical without being spiritual enough. And so we see the work and we know what needs to be done and we go about our tasks and, and we uh, work really, really hard and, and yet we never pray about it. We never take it to the Lord and the Bible warns against that. Psalm 127, for example, uh, says that unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards watch in vain. So pray for God's blessings and then keep working. Work hard, pray hard. In spite of the insults, they kept building uh, to the point where at this point in the story, they're halfway done. And again, the opposition doesn't go away. It usually doesn't at first. It usually gets worse before it gets better. And so in verse 7, we read that when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod, this is opposition that is growing, when they heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's wall, uh, walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. Now, at this point, they should have just said, 
uh, we were wrong, okay? We were making fun of you because of your wall and you weren't going to be able to build it, but now you can. Kudos to you. We're sorry. Instead, they double down. Their insults turn into threats. And so they all plotted together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. There it is again. They prayed and they worked. They prayed to the God, to their God, and they posted a guard. They were confident. Even though at this point it seemed as though the enemy had a huge advantage, Judah was surrounded if you look at the, the nations that are mentioned here, the, the regions that are mentioned, you have the Samaritans on the north, the Ammonites across the Jordan River on the east, the Arabs on the south, and now Ashdod, which is a city of the Philistines, they joined the coalition on the west. But even that opposition, in the middle of that opposition, that wasn't as bad as what was going to happen next. Because we're about to see that opposition move from an external threat to an internal threat. Here's what I mean. Verse 10, Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, The strength of our laborers is giving out, and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. You see, the armies were an external threat. The self-doubt and the second-guessing, that was an internal threat which I think is far more dangerous. I don't know about you, but to me, the internal threat is much more real. I mean, I can handle the haters. I can, I can ignore the scoffers, and I can deal with people who oppose the, the work of God, but, but maybe the most dangerous threat is that voice inside my own head that says, who do you think you are? What do you think you're doing? Working for God, speaking for God, building his kingdom? You're not worthy to do something like that. You're not equipped to do something like that. You'll never get it done. You'll never do enough. You'll never be enough. Now, you can post a guard for the external threat. But how do you deal with that? The internal opposition, that voice in your own head that says, I can't do this. Again, Nehemiah, the great leader he is, he's going to model that out for us. He gathers together those second-guessing and self-doubting Israelites, and he says, Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome. It's kind of funny to me how words that are meant to pack a punch uh, often lose their impact because of the way that we use them. We overuse words to the point where they don't mean anything. Uh, Great and awesome are two of those words, aren't they? I I just think about all the conversations that probably happened yesterday during the 4th of July celebrations where somebody said, honey, these hot dogs are great. And the potato salad, the potato salad is awesome. But when we're talking about the Lord, the almighty God, the creator of the universe, the God of heaven and earth, he truly is great and awesome. Remember him. When you are feeling unworthy and ill-equipped, you are feeling defeated before the battle even begins, remember the Lord, who is great and awesome. Remember what he has done for you and what he will continue to to do for you. Nehemiah told them, remember the Lord. He wanted them to remember what God's mighty hand can do. He also wanted them to rely on one another. Remember the Lord and rely on each other. Then I said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, the work is extensive and spread out and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. You see, Nehemiah was concerned that the people would be vulnerable as they were spread out, doing their own work in different sections of the wall throughout the city. 
and he was worried that they would be vulnerable to attacks from the enemy, that the enemy could come in and pick them off one by one. Dear friends, that's the same concern that I have for you. In a time when we are, to some degree, separated, whether it's by six feet in the same building or if it's, um, we're, we're staying in, in separate homes, but there is a lot of loneliness. There's a lot of vulnerability. And my concern is that the devil is going to use this time to attack us and to pick us off one by one because he knows that when we're alone, that's when it's time to strike. And if that's you, if you are, are feeling vulnerable, you feel like you are facing spiritual battles that you cannot win on your own, reach out. That's what we're here for. Just like Nehemiah told them, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, come and, and gather and fight alongside each other. That's what my prayer is for you and for our church, that, that when we hear somebody sound that alarm, that they are in some spiritual danger, that we go and we help them, we pray for them, we encourage them, we strengthen them with God's word and Christian love and friendship. And I want you to remember that. If you're feeling defeated before the battle even begins, you're not alone. You're not alone. You have brothers and sisters in this fight that you can rely on. It's amazing what happens when people remember the Lord and they, they rely on each other. We can see the Israelites do amazing things here in chapter 4 and then actually in, in chapter 6. I'll jump ahead here and, and read a passage to you about about what happens when people rely on one another and they remember the Lord God who fights for us. The wall was completed on the 25th day of Elul in 52 days. And when all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and they lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. May God grant that for all of us. Amen. Please stand for prayer. Gracious Father, uh, this weekend we are celebrating freedom in the United States. We ask for your continued blessings upon our nation. Give our leaders uh, guidance that their decisions bring order and justice to our society. Give to our citizens thankful hearts for the freedoms with which they have been blessed by you and provided by all the brave men and women who have risked their lives in armed services and, and in the military. We thank you for uh, all of them and for the, the blessings that you have allowed to come upon us through them. Strengthen our nation and bring us together uh, united in the desire for peace among our citizens. And most of all, we ask that your saving gospel message may continue to be preached and taught freely to your glory and for the saving of many souls. Help us to be the beacon of hope that you meant for your church to be, a city on a hill where your faithful people can find refuge and wayward souls can find welcome. We bring these prayers to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who earned our freedom from sin, death, and the power of the devil, and who has taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let's join now in confessing the Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. 
The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Once again, uh, after we dismiss here, we're going to dismiss from the back uh, toward the front, and it is another beautiful day out there. I would be more than happy to uh, stay for a while and, and talk. we got plenty of time before the next service, so I'm happy to greet uh, all of you outside um, after we uh, dismiss here and listen to music for a moment. Uh, but now I, I pray that you would go with the peace and blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated.